Welcome everyone to another TCS Plus. My name is G. I'm the moderator today. Uh, we have Oded Regev as the operator. And we're going to start by having him take us around the table and introduce the groups we have with us today. It's been very challenging today. Lots of groups. Let me try. So um, there's, uh, I believe, Amit Levy with the group from uh, Waterloo. Hi, everyone there. We have uh, Budima from EPFL. We I can't quite see you, but I believe you're there. I see the logo. Uh, Clemo with the group from uh, Colombia. Hi, uh, guys. Uh, uh, Dimitris from the from Wisconsin. Everyone. Uh, Esan from uh, USC. Everyone. Um, and we have uh, Gregory uh, from Indiana University. Everyone. Uh, we have Jalal from uh, Johns Hopkins University. We, I don't quite see you, but I believe you're there. Um, and we have Janish from uh, Caltech, the group from Caltech. Uh, Kevin from uh, University of Michigan. Okay. Hi. And we have uh, Samson. Um, you have to help me out here. Oh, from Purdue. Okay. Hi, Hi Samson. And we have Shravas from a few floors above me here at NYU, and the setting up. And we have uh, Sankirt from UCSD. You see a nice chair, but I'm sure you're there somewhere. OK, so back to you, G. Thank you, Oded. And I'd like to also mention that behind the scenes, we have uh, other organizers, including Clement Kanan and India Day, Thomas Vidic, and uh, Ilya Rosenstein. Uh, and I'd like to remind everyone to please, if you uh, have any questions, unmute yourself and ask uh, at any time. Uh, and without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today, Moses Charikar from Stanford. Uh, Moses completed his uh, PhD at Stanford uh, and spent uh, one year at Google and then uh, several years at Princeton, where he worked on a lot of exciting things, including approximation algorithms, uh, metric embeddings, uh, streaming algorithms. Uh, his work uh, maintains a good balance also. It has strong applications to practice as well, uh, evidenced by his, the award, uh, the Paris Kanellakis Award in 2014 for his work on uh, locality sensitive hashing. Without further ado, I'll ask him to take it away. Uh, sorry, Moses, Max has muted you, so you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, you press the microphone button at the top. Got it. Oh, okay. okay. Now you're with us. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I know it takes a lot of effort to organize these things uh, with all the technical issues and so on. So I really appreciate all the effort that everyone puts into this. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work I did recently on using hashing to estimate um, kernel density in high dimensions. and um, this is a uh, joint work with my student, Paris Simulakis at Stanford. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of jargon in that title. And uh, hopefully, as we go along, uh, some of these words will become clear. I should apologize. Uh, there seems to be some issue with my video. So it's, it's frozen uh, most of the time. But every once in a while, you'll see the picture move. But, uh, but hopefully, the slide should be fine. OK. So. Um, let me start with telling you what the problem is. Uh, so here's the problem. Uh, you have n points uh, given to you. These are points in high dimensions, y1 through yn. Uh, there's a certain potential function, kxy, which uh, takes two points, x and y, and outputs a value. And this, in some sense, is sort of the, the influence of one point on the other. And think of this as a function that drops off with distance. So it's highest when the distance is zero and falls off monotonically with the distance. Um, so you have this database of endpoints. You have this potential function, kxy. And there's a query point x. And what you'd like to do is evaluate the average potential at x from the points in the database. So you want to sum up the potential. Uh, contributions of each of the points in the database, k, x, y, and divide by the number of points. Okay, that's that's kernel. That's what you mean by kernel density estimation. 
Okay, and that's exactly the problem that we'll be talking about. Um, so, you know, when you look at it, it seems like a, a very simple problem. You have n points, you've got a summation that involves n terms, one involving each of these terms. You know, what's the thing to do? Well, obviously you go over all the points one by one and sum up all of these terms. It gives you essentially a linear time algorithm. There's some issue about how you compute each of these pairwise potentials, but let's not worry about that. The main question that we'll be thinking about is, can we do better than this? Okay, so if we wanted to estimate the value of this summation, um, could we do this without actually having to make a pass over the entire data set? Is it possible to somehow do some work up front um, so that we index the points in some way? And when the query point X is presented to us, we're able to estimate the value of the summation accurately with high probability. Okay. So let me, well, let me sort of tell you what, what are these, uh, so far, uh, you know, I have this mystery function KXY, this potential, but what exactly is this potential? Well, you know, if you have to think of one particular function KXY for the purpose of this talk, think about the Gaussian kernel. So this, this the, the value of this kernel KXY is just the, probability density function of the Gaussian. So it's a high dimensional Gaussian. The probability density is e to the power of minus Euclidean distance squared divided by sigma squared. Okay, the number of kernels that people think about, um, the Gaussian kernel is a very popular one, um, but there are also others. There is, is an exponential kernel where instead of having a square of the Euclidean distance in the, uh, in the exponent, you have just the Euclidean distance. Okay, you could also have polynomial kernels where the value of the kernel drops off as a inverse polynomial with the distance. Okay, but that's the basic question. So it's a very simple, simple problem. Okay, so, so now that we understand what the problem is, let me try to tell you, you know, why you might care about it. Okay, so here's the setup. Um, uh, you know, the, the setting where this problem typically arises is where you have a set of endpoints. These are sampled from some distribution that has some probability density P, okay? So we don't know what this density is, but what we'd like to do is we'd like to estimate what the value of this density is at some point X, okay? So we have some point X and we'd like to compute, estimate what the value of the density is. And you give another point, you know, like to figure out what the value of the density is at that point and so on and so forth. And all of this you have to do on the basis of these n samples from the density. Um, now, you know, there are many approaches to this, this kind of problem. I mean, one common approach, and this is an approach that folks in TCS have pursued quite a bit, is um, I assume something about this density function. Maybe it's a mixture of Gaussians or maybe it has some other form. And now from my samples, I can try to learn uh, or estimate the values of the parameters in my uh, functional form for the density, okay? So this is, this is some sort of parametric estimation. There's another um, you know, branch of statistics called non-parametric estimation where you would like not to make any assumptions about this density that you're trying to estimate. Can you still come up with estimates that uh, are close to the actual density without actually assuming any functional form for this density, okay? And in this field of non-parametric statistics, kernel density estimation is, one, is a very popular technique, okay? So how do you do this? Well, you, you essentially take your endpoints, if you want to estimate the value of your of the density at a new point x, then all you do is you you compute this kernel density estimate. Okay, and there are all kinds of results that show you that, um, you know, under suitable conditions, this will actually uh, converge to the actual density. Okay, so this is this is actually a very uh, popular technique in statistics, in non-parametric statistics for estimating these unknown probability density functions. Um, but this is actually, a, this turns out to be a useful subroutine. So, you know, it's a, it's a useful primitive and it, it gets all kinds of 
it has all sorts of applications. So one particular application is you'd, you'd like to find outliers. Okay, so given a data set, given a new point X, what you'd like to know is, you know, is this a typical point or is this an unusual point given the points that you've already seen? Okay, and one way to do this is, you know, well, go ahead and estimate this kernel density. If this kernel density is very low, then that tells you that this point is likely an outlier. If this kernel density is high, then it tells you, well, it's kind of a typical point. Okay, and if you think about it, it's, it's sort of doing something very natural, right? It's saying that if you have a point which is close to many points in your data set that you've already seen so far, then the kernel density is going to be high and then you would think of this as a typical point. If it's far away from most of your data set, right, then you would expect that this point is an outlier. Okay, so it turns out this is actually a useful technique for outlier detection and people do use it quite a bit. Uh, people also use it as a method of clustering and so on and so forth, but we won't really talk about these. In fact, it was this application to outlier detection that initially led us to start thinking about this question. Okay, so let me give you, uh, give you an example of what uh, you know, this kernel density might look like, okay? So let's say we have a set of points that, uh, this is a two-dimensional set of points that are sampled from a particular density, okay? So in the X and the Y axis, I have, uh, you know, the data set. The Z axis represents, the vertical axis represents the density function. So this is, you know, some density that I picked. I sampled the data set. And now uh, I want to figure out, you know, what this unknown density is. I don't have access to the density anymore. I only have access to the data set. So, you know, the first, first thing to do is, well, just, just take um, the discrete distribution that uh, is non-zero only on the points of your sample. Okay, so obviously this is a very bad approximation to this unknown density. That's not a good idea. So what's, what's the kernel density idea? The kernel density idea is just that you, you take this um, point distribution and smooth it out by, by uh, incorporating an appropriate smoothing function. Okay, and that's exactly what this kernel is. So you might, for example, put a little Gaussian around each of the points in your data set. Okay. And now average these Gaussian densities. Okay. Now, a lot depends on exactly uh, how, you know, what the variance or what the bandwidth of this Gaussian is. Okay, so suppose you end up picking a Gaussian which has um, very small sigma, very very low bandwidth. Then the resulting density that you get by averaging is not going to look very different from this uh, just this discrete distribution that we had earlier. It's going to have a lot of peaks around the points in the, in the set itself, and it's not really going to do much averaging. Okay, so that's that's a problem with having very low bandwidth. If you have very high bandwidth on the other end, then you'll do too much smoothing. You'll average things out too much and you'll actually lose some low level structure in your density. So, you know, it's, it's a problem. It, what I'm trying to point out is that it's really important if you really want to get a good estimate of this underlying density to pick the right bandwidth. Too small is not good, too high is not good. And there's a lot of literature that actually goes into trying to figure out exactly what the right, you know, what's a good choice of bandwidth for this problem. But for our purposes, we're going to assume that, you know, someone's actually done this work. Someone's told us that, you know, this is the problem that I want to solve. This is the bandwidth that I want to use. And we, as algorithm designers, now have the task of trying to figure out just how quickly we can estimate this kernel density. Okay. All right. Now, I, I should point out that you know, there are a number of there are other applications where you have similar looking functions where you have a set of points y1 to yn, you have a query point x, and you'd like to evaluate some sum over all of the points of some function where you know, each term in the summation is just a function of two points, the query point x and one of the database points yi. Okay, so for example, you know, the log partition function arises uh, uh, frequently okay and here this is well this is sort of a soft max function if you look at this function look at the summation the summation is just sum over all the points in the database y e to the power of beta inner product of x and y okay and again 
you know, if you had methods by which you could evaluate the summation quickly, then this would be very useful for all kinds of learning applications. Okay, so that's another example where we have this kind of summation involving n terms and the question is can we actually estimate this faster than actually evaluating all of the n terms one by one. Um, you know, another, uh, another situation arises when you're trying to do gradient descent. Um, let's say our goal is to, you know, we have some loss function. We'd like to minimize this loss function over the examples that we have. Okay, so we're trying to figure out the value of x, yi, uh, we have a set of examples, y1 through yn. There's a loss function which measures, gives you kind of the error or loss, as it's typically called in machine learning, between x and yi. So it's a, that's, that's each of these terms, l, x, y, i, tells you uh, how close x is to y, i. What you'd like to do is minimize the sum of these loss functions, okay? And a popular technique to do this is by doing gradient descent, okay? And when you do gradient descent, if you look at the gradient, the gradient again is the sum of such pairwise terms, okay? Now, one method to speed up gradient descent is to do so-called stochastic gradient descent. Instead of computing the full gradient, you actually come up with an estimate of the gradient. For example, just one term in this summation on average is a good estimate for what, the, what this term is. Okay, so think of it as a random variable that has the right expectation. And using such estimators can speed up this um, gradient descent in practice. Um, you could ask the same question. Can we can we come up, I mean, this is one particular estimator, just picking one term. Is it a better way to estimate what the gradient is in time less than linear in the number of terms? Okay, all right, so, you know, winding back to the, the actual problem that we'll be discussing. Again, this is the prototypical problem. You're given a database of points, y1 to yn, there's this potential kxy, a pairwise potential, there's a query point x, okay? And what we'd like to do is estimate the average of this pairwise potential kxy at the point x over all of the endpoints in our database, okay? All right, so, uh, you know, I alluded to this earlier. We're not going to try to compute this exactly. Instead, we'll try to estimate this. And we wanna come up with a good estimate. So let's say we have some, some parameter epsilon and we'd like to come up with an estimate within a multiplicative of one plus epsilon factor of the right answer with high probability, okay? And if you think of one particular kernel for this talk, think about the Gaussian kernel, okay? So the, the actual pairwise function that we care about is this Gaussian kernel, right? So that's the prototypical problem. All right, um, I should say that, actually uh, any questions at this point? I realize that everyone's muted, but do you guys have any questions about the actual problem, the basic setup? Uh, I hear, I see Clement saying something, but I can't hear him. Yeah, I think he was just unmuted for some reason. Um, so maybe let me ask, uh, are we focusing now on the kernel density estimation or the non-parametric? Uh, what, what should we keep in mind? So, you know, the problem that I want to do is this one. Okay, so I'm not really thinking about, I'm not gonna worry about how well this kernel density approximate this, approximates this underlying density. So someone's, you know, someone's figured out that this is a good problem to solve. They're using this as a subroutine. And my goal is to speed this up as much as possible without losing accuracy. Okay, so I wanna come up with a good estimate to this summation. Um, without doing linear amount of work? That's the question. Does that make sense, Oder? I see the question now from Clemo. Uh, you were right, he did ask a question and he's asking whether we can evaluate the kernel in unit time. Oh, whether we can evaluate the kernel in unit time. Um, so let's say we can, or let's say it's logarithmic. It's not gonna to be too important. So I'm not going to agonize about that too much. But yeah, let's say the kernel can actually be evaluated quickly. Okay, uh, for example, for these, these kinds of kernels that we're talking about, one could imagine you could, um, 
you might be worried that if your points themselves are high dimensions, as I as said they are, then you know just actually evaluating the Euclidean distance is going to be very expensive. But you can do dimension reduction, get it down to log n dimensions, and get a good estimate of distances. Okay, and use that in your estimate. So yeah, so for for our purposes, think of um, kernel evaluations as fast. Think of them as unit time. Okay, uh, we won't be. We might be off by a factor of log n, perhaps. All right. Any other questions? So, um, uh, are there any assumptions in the kernel that you make uh, for this approximation? Uh, so we'll state our results for different kernels. Okay. Um, I mean, presumably the the method that I'll describe could be applied to you know other kernels as well. Although I'll, I'll I'll actually state results for two or three families of kernels. Um, basically, we're assuming that uh, the kernel is monotone. Okay, it drops off with distance. Yes. Okay. And other than that, the results will somehow be, will involve some properties of the kernel, but we'll see as we go along. Okay. So keep the, keep the Gaussian kernel in mind for now. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so um, you know this kind of problem arises in non-parametric statistics, but another place where this kind of problem arises is in the so in the so-called batch model. Okay, so in um, for example, in n-body simulations, you have n particles. These are each exerting forces on each other, and what you like to do is you, you got to figure out for each of the particles what's the net force that it experiences. Okay, and then you might want to evolve the system. A little bit, and then recompute. You know what are what are the forces, the particles, and so on. So in simulating in these so-called n-body simulations, this is exactly the kind of the problem that you need to solve. Except that you know in this case the data set and the queries are exactly the same. It's you have n points that form the data set, and the queries are exactly the same set of n points. Okay, you'd like to actually evaluate the action of each of these queries. Sorry, the action of the data set on each of the points of the data set itself. So in this case, you know the the naive algorithm would take n squared time because there are n squared pairs of particles. You'd like to compute each of their pairwise interactions and add them up suitably. Okay, so naive algorithm is n squared for this problem. It turns out, and if you've never seen this before, it's pretty surprising. You can actually get by. Uh, you can get good approximations that run in time, n log n, and sometimes even linear. Okay, in the number of points. And this was sort of a big breakthrough in the late 80s and 90s. So done by uh, Greengard and Strain for the Gaussian function, and Greengard and Rockland more generally for, you know, for various other kinds of potential functions. This is, this is a method that's called the fast multipole method for the Gauss, Gaussian functions called the fast Gauss transform. This is enormously, influential method in numerical analysis. In fact, it was awarded the 2001 Steele Prize. It was also selected one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century by the editors of Computing in Science and Engineering. So it's a big deal in numerical analysis, okay? Um, and there's a, there's a similar, there's an analog of this method in uh, computational geometry. It's called the well-separated pair decomposition due to Carla Hahn and Kosaraju. So let me tell you, so this sounds really amazing, right? What, what was actually an n square time calculation can really be done in linear time or n log n. So maybe this is something that's useful also for the problem that I described, right? Where we have these endpoints, we're trying to uh, compute what's the, what's the total contribution at this one query point. Okay, so at a high level, you know, how do these, these fast multiple methods work? What they do is they rely on some kind of hierarchical uh, recursive space decomposition. Okay, so they take uh, space and they chop it up into pieces. I'm trying to find my cursor. Okay, and now they, if you wanted to evaluate what's the total uh, force, let's say at one particular particle, the insight is that if you look at some portion of the space that's very far away, okay, 
you don't need to worry about where exactly all of the particles in that portion are located. As long as you know that, you know, this is what you're trying to, you are trying to evaluate the action here. This stuff is so far away that you might as well aggregate them all into one piece. Okay, so you might as well approximate the action of all of these particles very far away by a single particle. Okay, and doing that does not actually introduce too much error. So applying this idea and then you know using various properties about these kernels, how, how do their tails fall off and so on, that essentially is the is the basic idea behind this fast multipole method. Okay, and amazingly, you can get runtimes which are linear or n log n. Okay. So this seems you know, this seems great. This seems like something we could actually apply for our problem. The caveat is that, you know, these rely on these space decompositions which really have an exponential dependence on dimension, okay? And the kinds of settings that Greengard and Rockland were really interested in was, you know, 2D or 3D. That's what really happens in, uh, in the physical world, right? They're interested in magnetic forces or gravitational forces. So these methods work really well in low dimensions, but they scale very poorly with dimension. So in our setting, you know, we're interested in high dimensional data. We're interested in finding outliers and so on and so forth. These space partitioning schemes are not going to work for us. Okay, so we need something else. All right, so just a recap, here's the problem. Um, we have this database of points. Just one more thing. Let's, let's assume for now that my potential function, um, the pairwise quantity that I'm trying to sum up, is some quantity between zero and one. I have my query point X and I'd like to estimate what is the value of this average potential contribution at the point X, okay? And one more piece of notation. Let's assume that for the X that I'm actually interested in, the actual value is mu, okay? The answer is mu, okay? So now let me ask you guys, how would you go, go about estimating this? So you have this problem. You know that you can estimate, you can compute it exactly in linear time, essentially. Can you do this faster? If you just wanted to estimate this value, how would you do it? Okay. In particular, can you actually express? Let me give you one hint. Can you actually express? Um, come up with a method where the the complexity, the amount of work that you need to do, is some function of mu, the actual answer that we're trying to estimate. So any thoughts? So I see some people are uh, cheating. Clement writes that based on the title, I'd like to use hashing. <laughs> but, oh, okay, okay, uh, all right, that's cheating. But, <laughs> that's not allowed. Uh, we'll, we'll do that in a few slides, okay? But before, before we think about hashing even, right? What What's the basic, what's the simplest thing that you would think about? Yeah, the sum of answers. One, one question before we get there. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confused because what you showed us previously, multiple allows us to compute the all pairs uh, uh, value with um, only order and time, but what does it do in terms of one versus all the others, as you are asking here? here is it better than order n? Uh, so, okay, I mean, I, I sort of hinted at this, and I guess I haven't really checked this, but the, the same kind of space partitioning techniques that they, uh, that they use in these fast multiple methods could in principle be used uh, to answer uh, this, uh, solve this problem in this query setting, okay? So presumably one could construct this, this space partition beforehand. And now when your query comes along, you place it within this, uh, this space partition that you've already constructed and now use exactly this fast multiple ideas to quickly come up with a, uh, estimate of what's the contribution for uh, at the query okay i assume the settings will really come like when you have many queries rather than one basically right sorry well i didn't get that uh, comment so so i think to that question probably like for one query you probably wouldn't get any savings but if you are across many queries then you'll get savings well so the thing is there is this upfront cost of actually building this uh, space partition okay and in some sense i'm giving that to you for free uh, even in, in my problem setup, right? So I said when I when you have this 
thing where uh, you have this database of endpoints, you get a preprocess and do whatever you want. And then after that, you got to answer the queries. So you're right. I mean, if you just are, had to answer one query, we're not going to get any advantage, but we're not going to get any advantage even from our eventual scheme that we will describe. So this really makes sense if you amortize that upfront cost over a lot of queries. Okay, any other questions? All right, so, you know, back to this. Uh, what's the first method that you would think of? Well, I would think the first thing that you would think of when you, if you had to estimate the sum, would be to just use random sampling, right? Why not sample some points of your database and just average their contributions and use that sample average as an estimate of the overall sum, okay? So how, how badly does this do? Okay, so let's think about it. Um, it turns out that if the right, so remember we have n terms, each term is a number between zero and one. The average is mu, okay? How many samples do you need to get a good estimate of this average? Well, you need one over mu samples, one over mu times one over epsilon squared. Okay, so one over epsilon squared is kind of standard. If you want to get one plus minus epsilon accuracy, you typically will have this overhead of one over epsilon squared. What about the one over mu? Well, in random sampling, right, if it turns out that your, your average value of mu comes about because mu fraction of the data has value one and one minus mu fraction of the data has value zero, then even to hit something with non-zero contribution, you're gonna to have to sample one over mu times, okay? So with the random sampling, you're stuck with one over mu samples. All right, does that make sense? Okay. And now the question is, can we do, can we do any better? Right, so can we do any better than random sampling? Random sampling needs one over mu samples. I'm gonna ignore the one over epsilon squared. I'm always gonna talk about the dependence on mu. And can we do any better? Okay, so I should say one more thing that, you know, another regime that people uh, have studied, actually one paper I studied a little bit, is additive approximations, okay? And if you allow yourself to get additive approximation, additive epsilon approximation. It's known that one can actually construct a small sample of size, something like one over epsilon squared. And this gives you a good estimate, additive epsilon approximation. Okay, so if you want to improve on random sampling, you know, the, the next idea, natural idea that comes along is to use what's called important sampling. Okay, so if we had so, okay, the setup is like this, right? We have a summation involving n terms, okay? Let's call them W1, W2, Wn. Wi is the kernel contribution of data point yi to the query x, okay? You want to estimate the sum of weights, sum of wi's. If we could sample, okay, so, you know, uh, random sampling has, highest variance when you know there are some terms that have high values and the other terms have really low values, okay? If you had a way to tweak the, the sampling distribution, if you could control the probability with which you sample element i, okay? Then you can actually reduce the, the variance of the sampling procedure, okay? And in particular, if you had the ability to sample i with probability qi and if you had if you have the freedom to design your own distribution QI, then one way to do this is to say, okay, I sample I with probably QI, and then I report WI by QI, okay? Now, the expected value of this estimator is just sum of WI. Okay, it's a very easy calculation. So it's great, this is an unbiased estimator. And the whole point is, by picking, by giving us ourselves the flexibility of designing a distribution QI, we can actually come up with a low variance estimator. So here's a question. What is, how should I set my QIs to get the lowest possible variance? Yeah. 
Yeah, anybody? Actually, I'm not able to see the chat. Maybe I should have. Uh, yeah, uh, some kid says based on distances. Based on distances. OK. Um, all right. So if you think about what's the variance of this particular estimator, OK? Um, the variance of this estimator, the expectation of z squared, is summation of wi squared divided by qi. Okay? And, and it's a simple exercise to show that the optimum setting of the qi's, these probabilities, are the qi should be directly proportional to wi. Okay, so you're right. In fact, we should we should sample with probably somehow a function of the distances. And if we really had complete flexibility over how we could sample, the right thing to do is to sample point i directly proportional to wi, its kernel contribution. Okay. I mean, okay, so the, there are many re reasons why this is too good to be true. Um, well, we can't do this because even to compute the normalizing constant in these probabilities, we'll need to know the sum of the wi's, which is exactly the quantity that we wanted to compute, right? Uh, if we actually did this, we would get variance zero. Okay, so this is not going to happen. But this is a good this is a good principle to keep in mind, right? If we had a way, so so, what is the lesson that we learned? The lesson that we learned is, if we wanted to improve over random sampling, we should think about sampling in a biased fashion. And it seems like the right thing to do is to bias our sampling in such a way that points that have high kernel contribution, high kernel values, are sampled with higher probabilities. Okay. All right. Um, and and when when we try to figure out you know how just how expensive this estimator is, you know, this is pretty standard. What we want to do is we want to compute what is the expected value of z squared, the square of the estimator, and just how high expected value z squared is relative to mu squared. That's what's going to determine how many samples I need. Okay, so my my goal is to try to design an estimator which has smallest possible value for expectation of z squared. Okay, smallest possible variance. Okay, so uh, now let me take a little bit of a detour and explain to you where we're going to get this method for implementing priority sampling, for important sampling. Okay, so so right now we've stopped at this point where it'd be great if we could design a way in which we could actually sample the points with probabilities somehow proportional to their kernel value. Now, um, so here's where our method is going to come from. This is an idea that's now about 20 years old. Um, it's a culmination of a lot of interesting work in theoretical computer science. But a beautiful paper of Indic and Motwani in the sequence introduced this idea of what's called locality sensitive hashing. So the basic idea is very simple. Um, if you had a family of hash functions, that somehow distinguish between near points and far points. Okay, so for two points that are close, the probability that they end up in the same hash bucket is much higher than this collision probability for two points that are far away. Okay, if you had such, such a family of hash functions, then this kind of hash function family can be used as a building block for nearest neighbor search. Okay, you simply construct a hash table using several such hash functions. You can construct not one, but several hash tables. And then you take the query, you map it to these hash tables using the same hash functions, and examine the contents of the hash buckets that the query falls into, okay? Um, so in this business, people give guarantees in terms of um, the approximate version of the nearest neighbor problem. So they say, well, if the if the optimum on if the nearest neighbor has distance r, they're happy to get something which is within distance c times r. Okay, and the guarantees for for these uh, locality sensitive hash uh, hashing based data structures are given as a function of c. Okay, the larger the value c you allow you're willing to allow, the better these data structures are going to perform. Okay. Um, and usually the, the way in which people study 
Um, sorry, is that a question? Getting an additive estimate cheaper. Sorry, I just saw some question pop up and I wasn't sure if it was for me. It was, uh, was a question for somebody else. I think it's for you. It's, his microphone is broken. I think he, he, what Clement means to say is that why can't you first get an additive estimate and then uh, you know, boost it into um, use that as the approximation of, of WI to get a so, uh, uh, first get what estimate? An additive estimate? You, you call it, you cited the result that gives you um, epsilon plus minus epsilon estimate. Oh, oh I see, I see. So I think the hard case for us uh, is exactly when the, the, the actual answer is very small value, right? And when mu, the actual answer of the return estimate is very small, then this additive epsilon is not going to be very interesting. And I don't know how to, how to make use of that at all. Right? And, and if you think about it, once you set epsilon equal to mu, you get essentially complexity one over mu squared, which is, um, not that interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So sorry, I, I missed the question. Okay, so going back to, to locality sensitive hashing, um, the usual analysis of locality sensitive hashing is in terms of trying to understand, you know, if you look at two distance thresholds, R and C times R, just how fast does the collision probability drop off from one threshold to the next? Okay. And rho is some parameter that, that measures you know how separated these two probabilities are it's not it's not terribly important for us how exactly rho is computed but a lot of work goes into trying to understand how exactly rho behaves as a function of c okay and um, you know this locality sensitive hashing stuff is fairly mainstream now like for example this is a figure from a paper in um, in science a couple of years ago where people are trying to use lsh to uh, detect uh, earthquake signals. Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly a method that's been adopted quite widely in practice. Um, a couple of LSH constructions that I'll, I'll point out, there's, there's several. One uh, was by Data, Remodelica, Indic, and Mirokni. It's a very simple uh, locality sensitive hash function. Um, it takes points in Euclidean space, it projects them down to a single line. It buckets the line into buckets of width w and, and shifts this bucketing a little bit by a random amount. And the hash value is just the ID of the bucket that you fall into. Okay, so it's a very simple thing. Project onto the line, discretize the projection, that's the value of your hash function. Um, another uh, hash function that we'll refer to later is one introduced by Andoni and Indic in 2006. Um, it's a slight generalization of this idea. You, you take your points in Euclidean space, you now, instead of projecting down to a single line, you project them to t-dimensional space for some large constant t. And then in this t-dimensional space, you partition it by doing some kind of ball partitioning. You sort of think of it as, you know, pull out a ball, pull out another ball, pull out another ball, and every point gets assigned to the first ball that it falls into, okay? Um, it turns out that for L2, uh, the value of rho that you get for this one um, is one over c squared, and that is actually the right dependence. Okay, so this is actually the optimum um, LSH scheme for L2. Okay, uh, what's the, okay, there are a few other things that uh, I'm just gonna mention in passing. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in LSH. I mean, this work, as you see, was done about 10 years ago. But in the last two, three years, there's been a resurgence of interest in locality sensitive hashing. And one of the key insights was that, you know, um, all of these methods that we had before ran up against uh, a wall, uh, but because they were data oblivious, they actually did some kind of choosing your hash functions and this partitioning of space without actually looking at the data, the actual data, the, the distribution of the data. But it turns out that if you allow yourself the ability to, to look at the data and do something that is data dependent, then you can break these lower bounds. And now uh, we have even better schemes that actually partition the data based on the structure of the data itself. Okay. All right. Um, 
back to where we were. I mean, remember, we were thinking about important sampling. The idea was it would be great if we could somehow sample points with probabilities proportional to these kernel values, but we didn't know how to do that. Okay, and we, we took this interlude into discussing LSH. Okay, the key insight is that, you know, locality sensitive hashing is a very powerful method. You know, it's a beautiful method for approximate nearest neighbor search. But the key insight is that it actually gives us a bias sampling scheme. Okay, and this insight was also independently developed by Spring and Srivastava in a recent paper. So, you know, what, what is LSH? LSH is a scheme by which um, you, can, you can build this hash table. You have a certain collision probability, the probability that two points X and Y end up in the same bucket. What exactly the collision probability is, is a function of you know, the, the space that you're operating in and the hash family that you pick. But you can control this collision probability to some extent by picking an appropriate hash family, okay? And the point is, if you build a hash table and then map the query X to this hash table, you could think of the set of elements that are in the same bucket as the query as a biased sample of the data set, okay? So we, want a we wanted a bias sampling scheme. Well, LSH gives us a bias sampling scheme, okay? Uh, so could this be an efficient implementation of priority sampling? Um, well, the caveat is that this is a somewhat dependent sampling scheme, okay? It's not quite, it, it's not that every element I is sampled independently with probably QI. So we have to sort of tweak this a little bit to make this work for us. Um, so, okay, so let's say we have n points, y1 to yn. Each of them has a weight wi, this kernel contribution. We have a, um, an LSA scheme which has collision probabilities pxy. So let's say the probability that yi ends up in the same bucket as x is pi. Okay, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to map query x to its hash bucket h of x. And then we're gonna pick a random element yi in h of x and use that as our sample, okay? So that's how we're gonna use LSH to get a bias sample. The question is how should we analyze this, okay? So, you know, the, the analysis of important sampling somehow suggested that if we had to do this, the best choice of LSH should be one where the collision probability is exactly proportional to the weight, right? Is exactly proportional to the kernel value, right? That's kind of the insight that we got out of important sampling. But it turns out that if we if we do important sum, I mean, if we use LSH to, to get a bias sample, the probability of sampling YI is not quite the collision probability, right? So YI needs to end up in the same hash bucket as X. That happens with probably PXYI. That having happened, you're going to look at all the elements of the hash bucket. You're going to pick one of them at random. You're actually not going to look at all the elements. You're going to just pick one of them at random. So the probability that YI is going to be picked is inversely proportional to the size of the hash bucket. Okay. Now the numerator of this term is something that we can control. It's, it's a function of the hash family that we pick. The denominator on the other hand, is something that you know we don't quite have control over. It depends on the on the structure of the data set. So, how could we possibly analyze this? Right? It seems like somewhat intractable. Okay. So, um, I'll try to motivate this analysis by by working through an a quick example. Okay, and I'll I'll give you a summary of what what results we get. All right. So, um, this is our scheme. We're going to use LSH to get a bias sample. Now. The final estimator that we use is, remember in, in priority sampling, it was wi divided by qi, right? In this case, it's gonna be wi divided by pi, the, pro the collision probability, times the size of the hash bucket. Okay, that's gonna be our estimator, right? So just as, just as priority sampling, this is so important sampling, this is an unbiased estimator and all, all of that. The main question is what's the variance of this estimator? So the, if you compute the second moment of this estimator, it turns out to be a somewhat scary looking expression. Um, you know, as before, we have this summation of wi squared by pi. This is exactly the expression that we had for important sampling. 
But now we have this term which is which comes from the size of the hash bucket. We get the expected value of the hash bucket given that yi belongs to the hash bucket. Okay, and this seems somewhat unwieldy. It's not clear how to how to analyze this. Okay, so let's let's work through a, a, a very quick example just to get a, a sense for you know what we should be doing. Okay. So for this example, I'm going to instead of thinking of this estimator, I'm actually going to average over the n data points. So I'm going to just take this estimator divided by n. Okay, so the value of the estimator is wi divided by pi times the fraction of the data set that's in the current hash bucket that's size of hx divided by n okay and here's the here's the example that i want to think about let's think of this instance where mu fraction of the data set is at distance zero and has weight one okay and one minus mu fraction of the data set has distance square root log one over mu it has weight mu okay the square root log one over mu just because I'm assuming that I have a Gaussian density. All right. So mu fraction has weight one, one minus mu fraction has weight mu. And suppose we're able to design a sampling scheme so that the probability of the collision probability for the i point is the weight raised to the power of beta. Okay. So initially I said, well, maybe we should have a sampling scheme where the collision probability is exactly the weight. I say, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. Let's try to look at schemes where I have collision probability equal to weight raised to the power of beta. And let's try to figure out what the you know what the right value of beta might be. Okay. Now the expected value of my estimator is just the kernel density. In this case, the kernel density is is very close to two times mu. Okay, so that's an easy calculation. You get contribution of one from mu fraction and contribution of mu from one minus mu fraction. Okay. The key point is what is the um, expectation of y squared? Okay. So here's what you should think about. Okay. The collision probability is wi to the power of beta. So here's what's going to happen when you apply this to this period data set. With probability very close to one, one minus mu to the power of beta, the hash bucket will only have points of weight one, okay? And with probability mu to the power of beta, the hash bucket is going to have all the points in the data set, all right? Now, if you do the calculation, and maybe since we're running a little short of time, I won't actually work through the calculation, but it's not very hard at this point. You should be able to do it by yourself if you'd like. It turns out that the expectation of y squared, the variance, is mu to the power of one plus beta plus mu to the power of two minus beta. Okay, that, these are the dominant terms, the rest of the terms don't matter. All right, so here's what we have. Um, for this particular instance where, you know, you have just points at two different distances, distance zero and some large distance, the expected value is two mu and the expected value of y squared is mu to the power of one plus beta plus mu to the power of two minus beta. Okay, so obviously we should try to equalize the two terms and set beta equals 0.5. And for this, the expected value of y squared divided by, divided by mu squared is about one over square root mu. Okay. So if you remember the analysis of random sampling estimator, there the variance was one over mu. Okay. And in, uh, I mean, the, the normalized variance is one over mu. This estimator, if this indeed is kind of the worst case, it suggests that we might be able to get sample size one over square root. All right, so two theorems about this. So it turns out that, you know, even though the expression for the variance of these estimators that we get out of hashing is a little unwieldy and, and seemingly complicated, the worst case variance really arises from these two point configurations. So this kind of analysis that we did, it's great. This is really the, these are really the worst cases, and we can show that. Okay, and then uh, it turns out that if we are able to design hashing schemes where the collision probability is the kernel value raised to beta, for beta between 0.5 and 1, we can show that the variance of this estimator is mu to the power of 2 minus beta. Okay, so indeed the best thing to do for us is to set beta equals 0.5. Okay.
So to summarize, we we have this um, new way to think about LSH as a way to facilitate important sampling. And this makes us sort of go back and redo the analysis of all of these LSH schemes. Okay, so typically look at these sensitive hashing has been analyzed in the setting where if you want to see approximate nearest neighbor, what's the complexity of your hashing scheme? Okay. Um, we weren't able to use those results as a black box. We had to go back and kind of redo their analysis by relying on the same hash functions, but you know, analyzing different things. It turns out that you know, for the right thing to do is, as our results suggest, is that whatever kernel you're interested in, you need to pick the LSH family that's sort of appropriate for it. So it turns out for the Gaussian kernel, if you pick the the you know the project onto a single line. Euclidean LSH, you get complexity mu to the one over mu to the three fourths. Okay. On the other hand, if you pick the Andoni indic uh, LSH, which projects to t dimensions, you get one over square root mu. Um, for the exponential kernel, the projecting on a single line itself gives you the one over square root mu complexity. And also for the polynomial kernel, you can get um, one over square root mu. Okay. Um, the running time can be made adaptive to mu. So, so these these uh, results suggest that some of the running time is a function of the answer that you're trying to compute. What you can you can easily modify the scheme so that um, you know if mu is small, you you terminate quickly and you certify that mu is small. Sorry, if mu is large, you terminate quickly and certify that mu is large. On the other hand, if the kernel density is small, then you take a little little longer. And how long you take is exactly one over square root mu. Okay, uh, just a couple of other things. Um, it turns out that we can also do things like say that, well, if your data is, has some pseudo random structure, um, not all of it is clustered in, in a small amount of space, then you can actually get some better bounds, although I won't actually state them explicitly. Um, there are some lower bounds that one could get for the batch setting, but these lower bounds need uh, values of epsilon that are very, very tiny. Um, and they rely on the strong exponential time hypothesis. This is, this is work of Backer's, Indic, and Schmidt. Um, a few other things I just wanted to mention, some directions of, of ongoing work. So one thing that we realized subsequent to this work, this is joint work with uh, Piotr Indic and Artus Backus, is that um, for the polynomial kernel, okay, where the kernel density drops off, uh, where the potential drops off as a polynomial function of the distance, you can actually get polylogarithmic query time. Okay, so right now the results that we have in general are one over square root mu. Of course, if mu is tiny, then this means that you're going to spend a lot of time. But for the polynomial kernel, you can always guarantee that you get polylogarithmic poly query time. Um, you can modify these methods to estimate not just these kernel functions we're talking about but estimate sums of general functions of inner products where your pairwise terms are of the form e to the power of some function of inner product. And that can also be done, although this is still you know, work in progress. It seems that data-dependent LSH should give improved bounds, although we, are, um, we haven't quite nailed all the details there. It, it seems like it should be plausible, but we don't quite have, uh, have a result that we can go to that at this point. And finally, uh, it would be interesting to experiment with this idea. It's a very simple idea of using locality sensitive hashing. It's a very practical scheme for high dimensions. And I'm hoping that just as LSH became, you know, sort of a method of choice for practitioners, this would also be something that people would uh, readily implement for kernel density in high dimensions. Okay, I'll stop there. I think I'm a little bit over time. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Moses. Uh, at this point, we'll take some questions from the audience. So, one question? Uh -huh. I wonder, so if we can open the black box, as you suggested at the end, uh, it seems like what's actually going on is you basically take your set of points, you're maybe projecting it in some way, um, and then there's some bucketing going on. Um, 
it sounds a bit like um, the following naive uh, idea of uh, projecting my points to lower dimensional space and then maybe applying the, the multipole, the, 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 the old algorithm that works in low dimensions. Would it, are there any connections between those two things? Is there... um, so, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure exactly how you intend to implement this. One, one thing is that what's happening with this projection is purely being used to facilitate sampling. Right? And then eventually we're coming with an estimate based on sampling. Whereas if you project to low dimensions, um, you kind of distort the distances a little bit. And if you do multiple on, on those distorted distances, I think you would be, uh, you would have a lot of error. Okay. So, so that's, that's one problem that you we're really doing this projection to lower dimensions to facilitate sampling. Okay. In fact, I should say that, you know, this, in this, um, polylogarithmic query time that we have for the polynomial kernel, this is really, this is really the idea where we, we are indeed projecting to lower dimensions. And then instead of working with these lower dimensional distances directly, we're actually using this low dimensional projection as a way to facilitate a good sampling scheme. But having found a good sample, we then proceed and, and work with the original distances in the original space. Okay, so it, it is useful to kind of open that black box up a little bit, but in a slightly different way, uh, at least the way that we approach. We have one question in the chat here from uh, Clement Canon. What happens if you use kernel approximation methods like random Fourier features for kernel density estimation? So um, as far as we know, it actually doesn't give us uh, improved results, okay, for, uh, for our setting. So I, if we use random Fourier features, uh, I don't quite remember what the, what the calculation was, but it actually doesn't even do better than random sampling, okay, for this particular setting. All right, are there any other questions here? If not, I'm going to take us offline shortly and you can still hang around and chat, chat with the speaker. Uh, I just wanna remind you of some upcoming talks we have. In particular, two weeks from now, we're, we'll have Seth Petty. Uh, two weeks from then, we'll have Ola Svensson. And one week from then, to avoid clashing with Thanksgiving, will be uh, Vinod Vaikuntanathan. All right, thank you all for joining. <laughs>